Frank will be introducing our next speaker giving testimony today. Hey, and I'll say hi to Michael Feinstein. I know Mike too. Our next uh, speaker Frank. is Jeremy Kosmeroff. Uh, he's the managing editor of Covert Action Magazine. He's written four books on US foreign policy, including The Russians Are Coming Again, The First Cold War as Tragedy, The Second as Farce with John Marciano. And I do wanna say also say hi to John who is having some health issues, but John is a great guy, a friend of mine. And uh, Jeremy, are you on? Yes, can, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. And yeah, this a book may interest people. Uh, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, John is in ill health as he was supposed to be here as well. But yeah, th this, uh, our book, The Russians Are Coming Again, yeah, is definitely written in the revisionist tradition uh, that was being discussed before. Uh, and I think makes a you know very strong case and, you know, links the horrors of the first Cold War with the new Cold War. And I think, you know, we're living through the same paranoia. Uh, actually, we start the book with, uh, you know, the Academy Award winning film 1966, which some of you may be aware of. The Russians are coming. The Russians are coming, directed by Norman Jewison, parody parodies this Cold War paranoia then pervading the United States, depicting the chaos that seizes a small coastal New England town after a Soviet submarine runs aground. Half a century later, Americans are again, you know, we thought we're past that era, but for the last five years at least, we've been again warned daily of the Russian menace with persistent accusations of Russian aggression, lies, violations of international law, and cyber attacks on U.S. elections, as reported in leading uh, supposedly liberal outlets like New York Times and Washington Post and CNN, among others. Uh, the charges are many and relentless and include alleged poisoning, assassinations, bounties on U.S. soldiers. Uh, like all propaganda, there may be some grain of truth to some of the charges, but most of the allegations are unfounded and appear to be uh, untrue. The consequences, though, have been severe. A new Gallup poll finds that just 22% of U.S. citizens view Russia favorably, while 72% hold unfavorable views towards it which is a huge difference from about 15 years ago when most Americans had a, a positive view of Russia at the end of the Cold War. Uh, Democrats troublingly hold particular hostility towards Russia with fewer than one in six uh, telling Gallup they maintain positive opinions about the country as opposed to 25% of Republicans and 24% of independents. Uh, these totals indicate the high level of social conditioning whose end result could be war. And uh, there's a parallel, I think, with World War I and the uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, orchestrated propaganda campaigns against Germany, as well as in the first Cold War, where social conditioning uh, led to the fear about the Soviet Union that was greatly unfounded you know, after World War II, especially in considering that the Soviet Russia had been devastated, uh, leading the charge against Nazi Germany and su uh, suffered 27 million casualties. Yet many Americans believe that Russia was going to start a new war, which was uh, totally fanciful, uh, given the context. But to understand, I think, the danger of what we're facing, we, we are living through a very uh, dangerous period in history right now with very reckless leadership uh, in both parties, uh, evident in these recent statements of Joe Biden. Uh, to understand the danger of the new Cold War, it is necessary to reexamine the original conflict between the United States and the USSR. The present Russia panic falls an entire century of fear mongering and threat inflation dating to the Russian Revolution that has long served the interests of the US military industrial complex and security state. It has little to do with either Russian or American realities, which have been consistently distorted. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev said uh, that the Cold War, you know, this was perhaps the best synopsis uh, of the Cold War was given by Gorbachev, the Soviet premier, who said the Cold War made losers of us all. Uh, the losers included, uh, you know, the people in Korea and Vietnam uh, who died in the uh, millions, uh, third world countries which were destabilized. Uh, the losers included Americans uh, with the militarization of the U.S. political economy, the threat of nuclear war, environmental uh, catastrophes bred by nuclear weapon development, and abuses of civil liberties. As Carl Marzani, an Office of Strategic Services and State Deployment employee, uh, described in his book, We Can Be Friends, it was a, vic a victim of McCarthyism. Uh, he said the Cold War threw the United States into semi-hysteria 
and a manufactured war psychosis with dog tags on children, airplane spotters on 24 hour duty, roads marked for quick evacuations, buildings designated as air raid shelters, air raid drills everywhere in street stores and schools. Uh, the Cold War uh, also devastated, as we know, whole communities of leftist organizers and union uh, members from the McCarthyite witch hunts to the mass persecution of political radicals by US client states in Latin America and Southeast Asia. Uh, few Americans today realize that it was the United States that first ignited these hostilities by invading Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. The Woodrow Wilson administration sent 10,000 US troops from the European theater of the First World War, alongside the British, French, Canadians, and Japanese to aid the white generals, counter-revolutionary generals, uh, tied with the morally bankrupt Zara system, uh, who were implicated in wide-scale atrocities in this war, including uh, perpetuating pogroms against Jews, which the Tsarist regime had uh, perpetuated uh, for a decade before. Uh, many Americans who fought were horrified by what they were doing, just like in the Vietnam War. Uh, one Lieutenant Colonel Robert Eichelberger said, the atrocities of the US allies would have been shameful in the Middle Ages. Uh, the memoirs, you have US soldiers in this uh, ill-fated mission uh, were similar to uh, memoirs of US soldiers in the Vietnam War. And yeah, I have one poem I could read uh, in Russia's field, uh, modeled after the famous First World War poem, Flanders Field. Uh, in Russia's field, no poppies grow. There are no crosses row on row to mark the places where we lie. No lark so grayly singing fly as in the fields of Flanders. We are the dead. Not long ago, we fought beside you in the snow. And they were fighting in Siberia and gave our lives. And here we lie though scarcely knowing reason why, like those who died in Flanders. And you know, uh, this war was carried out illegally uh, without the consent of Congress and was opposed by the uh, US Army commander uh, of, of the troops in Siberia, General William S. Graves, a Texan, who expressed doubt if history will record in the past century a more flagrant case of flouting the well-known and approved practice in states and their international relations and using instead of the accepted principles of international law, the principle of might makes right. Uh, unfortunately, these events are hardly recorded in our history textbook. There was uh, that book, Lie My Teachers Told Me, found that it was rarely mentioned in any uh, history textbook uh, given to high school students. And if it was mentioned, it was mentioned in a distorted way. Uh, the historian D.F. Fleming, who wrote a good history of the Cold War, wrote that, for the American people, the cosmic tragedy of the intervention in Russia does not exist or was an unimportant incident long forgotten. But for the Soviet people and their leaders, the period was a time of endless killing, looting and raping, of plague and famine, of measureless suffering for scores of millions, and experience burn into the very soul of the nation, not to be forgotten for many generations, if ever. Also, for many years, the harsh Soviet regimentation could all be justified by fear that the capitalist power would be back to finish the job. It is not strange that in an address in New York, September 17, 1959, Premier Khrushchev should remind us of the intervention, the time you sent the troops to quell the revolution, as he put it. Uh, the Bolshevik drive, the main basis for this intervention was economic. The Bolshevik drive to nationalize industry and seize foreign assets was ideological and economic anathema to the US capitalist ruling elite. Uh, the US in 1917 held investments of over $658 million in Russia were at stake with the Russian revolution. The economic basis of, of, for opposing communism gets lost in much commentary about the history of the Cold War and most uh, academic scholarship ignores it. Uh, but it's really central, and I, I appreciate what Dan Ellsberg was discussing, uh, the central uh, role of lobbyists and special economic interests in driving forward uh, these war scares and wars. Uh, after World War II, one of the key architects of the Cold War was W. Avril Harriman, who happened to be the mentor of Joe Biden when Joe Biden was first elected to the U.S. Senate. Harriman was the son of E.H. Harriman, one of the original robber barons, who made his fortune in the railroads and was a founder of the legendary Wall Street investment firm Brown Brothers Harriman, which had German Nazi financiers as some of its clients. 
Uh, also, most significantly for our purpose, Brown Brothers Harriman had considerable investments in zinc mines in Poland and other parts of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, which were nationalized when the communists took over. Uh, this was the basis for Harriman's vendetta. He took the, the Bolshevik government to court. He got some settlement, but uh, he lost millions of dollars uh, when his mines were taken over by the Russian government. And this fueled a lifelong hatred for communism by him and others in his class. Uh, Harriman served as US ambassador to Moscow at the end of World War II. Uh, according to FDR's son, James Roosevelt, FDR uh, was a strong leader as uh, Peter's talk underscored. Uh, FDR was very smart, uh, visionary leader who stood up to anti-Russia hawks like Harriman in the State Department and promoted a peaceful policy towards Russia, evident at the Alta Conference, which Henry Wallace was intent on uh, continuing. However, due to those shenanigans Peter described, Wallace was removed from office and Harry Truman took over. Truman, as we know, was a provincial who was easily malleable and allowed Harriman and his associates and the aerospace industry to have free reign. And the result was the Cold War. Uh, Harriman came to direct the Marshall Plan, one of whose main intentions was to isolate Russia and undermine communism in Europe. And Harriman later supported the Vietnam War as Under Secretary of State under the Lyndon Johnson administration. Uh, the Cold War, as we know, orchestrated by Harriman and others in the you know, big business and Wall Street were the primary drivers of this policy. Uh, this policy bred horrible human costs for humanity. Uh, equivalent, as is pointed out, to the genocide of the Native Indians and African slave trade. Uh, the Korean War alone uh, led to the deaths of one-tenth of the North Korean population and biblical devastation in North Korea resulting from the U.S. bombing campaign. Uh, the, there was a truth commission in South Korea revealed that U.S. allies committed six times more atrocities than the uh, North Koreans. Uh, it uh, pointed to uh, horrible atrocities from torture to the strafing of refugees. Uh, copious amounts of napalm were deployed. Uh, it, it was a truly a horrific war. A germ warfare may have also been deployed. And this foreshadowed the horrors of the Vietnam War. Uh, in fact, there's a new article in the New York Times uh, magazine today about Laos and the uh, residue of Agent Orange and the deformities uh, of children. Uh, so, you know, the human costs are just unconscionable of these wars and are felt generations later. Uh, and, you know, the Covert Action is, uh, you know, magazine uh, was founded by Phil Agee, who is a CIA whistleblower, who was aghast at the torture uh, being promoted uh, by U.S. clients and neo-Nazis in uh, Latin America. And it, you know, exposed uh, the crimes of the CIA uh, from assassinations to sponsoring torture and death squad regimes. Uh, around the world, as well as things like drug testing on unwitting suspects, uh, as well as uh, appears the murder of U.S. whistleblowers such as uh, Dr. Frank Olson, a CIA biochemist who threatened to expose germ warfare programs in the Korean War, was thrown from the 10th floor of a hotel in Midtown Manhattan after being beaten to death by two CIA thugs. Uh, this story only came to light a few years ago. Uh, so, uh, you know, these crimes were all justified in the name of anti-communism and the Cold War and containing Russia. And, uh, you know, we have to be wary about uh, these kinds of excesses that will emerge today from the new Cold War. And let me end with two indicative quotes. Uh, one is by Linus Pauling. Uh, was a brilliant scientist and Nobel laureate who says, and this uh, underscores the tragedy of uh, you know, uh, Henry Wallace and his removal from office. Uh, Paula said, who can say that this, that what the world would have been like if Henry Wallace had remained vice president in 1944? There's a possibility that he could have been successful in averting the Cold War. There might have been no American involvement in the war in Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, or Laos. The military dictatorship sponsored by the US in many countries might have not come into existence. Tens of thousands of people who are now political prisoners, he was writing 1970, uh, might have remained free. International treaties might have been made that would have saved the United States and Soviet Union hundreds of billions of dollars. We might have a better world today. 
And let me also uh, read a quote from Bernard Gordon, was a reader for Paramount Pictures, it underscores the point of Gorbachev that the Cold War made losers of us all. Uh, Bernard Gordon, a reader for Paramount Pictures, fired for his left-leaning views and author of Living in Interesting Times or How I Learned to Love the Blacklist, told an interviewer in 1997 that, quote, most people think about the terrible personal effects of McCarthyism, the ruined careers and lifetimes, even the deaths of people who were affected, all true enough and not to be slighted. Others think of the fear not only engendered in the entertainment industry in schools and universities and the press and the media, all true too. But my own sense goes beyond even that. I feel that the black period laid the groundwork for much that followed. The Nixon and Reagan regimes, which glorified the Cold War as a holy enterprise, which used the slogans of anti-communism to construct monstrous military machines that virtually bankrupted the country and place the industrial military complex in such a powerful position that even today with the evil empire gone, there seems to be no way to stop the expenditures for arms and the export of arms. Eisenhower warned of this in his farewell address. But even beyond that, there's a sense that the convenient anti-communism has become anti-government with respect to all social programs that came out of the FDR era. The rich and powerful who grow more rich and powerful each day use blacklisting and McCarthyism to dismantle everything liberal, to make liberalism a dirty word, so that today both parties vie to be more reactionary. And these comments were made in 1997, but uh, they're certainly prescient having lived through the Trump years, uh, and perhaps the tide is starting to turn a bit given the disasters we've experienced. But I think you know the comment; those two comments should be heeded today, as we're you know very clearly repeating the follies of the past and embarking on a new Cold War. And events like the webinar we are part of today are extremely important, as we need to remember the first Cold War and its horrors and commemorate that history. Then we need to mobilize together, inspired by the legacy of Henry Wallace and other Cold War dissenters to resist this new Cold War so that we might, as Pauling suggested, have a better world in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy.